Good evening, chosen ones. Welcome to Virtual Beelzebub TV. I am your host, Beelzebub, and welcome back to the pit. So today, I wanted to talk about the Call of Cthulhu uh, uh, tabletop role-playing game. I've recently gotten into it. I think it's kind of cool. And I wanted to uh, show off what I know and uh, show off some uh, useful tools. So when you get the starter set, uh, after you buy the box, I highly recommend getting an account at Dole's house. Because D&D uh, &D has so many different resources available to help you out, mainly like D&D &D Beyond or um, I think Roll20 or a handful of uh, websites can help you out. But Dole's house is kind of your only option. So I wanted to show it off. So once you create an account, which is pretty straightforward, I wanted to show you how to work the website. So once you're here, go to Call of Cthulhu. Nope. I have to log in. So under Call of Cthulhu, you have the uh, go to your 7th edition investigator. 7th edition is the most recent edition. And we're actually going to uh, go ahead and create a new character. Now, you can see I've already created many characters. But we're going to go to the point by characteristics investigator generator. I This is the method I understand the best. So, in order to make your Call of Cthulhu uh, character on Dole's house... You get you're given um, some uh, some characteristic points, some of which are are mandatory to spend. Like you have to have at least forty intelligence and and size. So let's just run through this really quickly. Strength, dexterity, intelligence. These operate just like Dungeons and Dragons or any other tabletop role playing game. Constitution. I mean, this is really basic stuff. They do exactly what they what you think they do. You know, lifting heavy stuff. Fine kinesthetic movement, general intelligence, your body's uh, resistance, and this is appearance, which is how attractive you are. Honestly, I've played multiple, uh, I've played a campaign of this, never came up. Like, the only time it ever really comes up is when your uh, player is trying to seduce an NPC, but even then, the players can use charm instead of just appearance, so complete waste of time. Power is really only useful if your uh, DM allows you to play a magical character. Because there are like cultists and whatnot that'll, that can use magic. And there are magic items in the game that require you to invest magic in order to use it. But if your DM insists that you be ordinary people and it's a very, you know, low magic setting, not a lot of magic items, which a lot of DMs do. You know, unless you're explicitly going to be involved with... Uh, using spells and magic items it's not going to help you out too much again depends on your dm ask ahead of time size is how big you are so uh 40 is like you are like four foot nine uh 120 pounds uh like you're just not no meat on your bones whereas 90 is like you were Six foot six, 300 pounds. You are Dave Batista. You are Dwayne the Rock Johnson. And what this does is it uh, adds and subtracts from your damage bonus. So your damage bonus is... Um, you can see when I bring that all the way down to 40, your damage bonus is minus two. That's because you're tiny. Anytime you try to make a melee attack and really put some physical oomph behind it, put some weight behind it, uh, you're going to be less capable of doing so unless you put points into stealth. So you would, if you want to make a melee character, at least put 70 into size. Education is, um, well, it's exactly what it sounds like, how learned you are. Now, it's a little bit different from D&D. In D&D, intelligence is book smarts and wisdom is kind of like, uh, like street smarts. Like things like, you know, uh, survival, uh, things... Uh, I can't remember all the stats off the top of my head. But in this one, intelligence is problem solving. Edu is your education. Uh, and move, this is how fast you move. Now, it starts with seven. And what is seven? That is yards. Unlike D&D, &D, which is uses its increments of five feet, 
This system uses yards, which makes it a lot easier to explain to uh, players from outside the U.S. who are more familiar with meters, because you can just use these inter interchangeable seven yards, seven meters, whatever. It's a lot better than increments of five feet. So let's start by cranking up dexterity. And you can see it can be from 15 to 90. You'll notice my move has gone from seven yards to eight yards. So if you want to have... So again, you need at least 70 dexterity in order to get your move from seven to eight yards. Um, now you'll see that these kind of move as you put points in your character. Like education doesn't move anything. And you see as you increase your power, you're increasing your magic points and your sanity. So your power is directly linked to your sanity. Now sanity is super useful. This is the, honestly, I take back what I said about power. If you want to have a character who is resistant to going insane, which is a thing that can happen and happen easily, you know, the horrors of the uh, the great old ones and the, the dark mysteries and the cults and whatnot can drive your character absolutely insane. So by increasing your power, you increase your ability to withstand madness. And you also see your uh, magic points go up. Um, and again, that's kind of like uh, spell slots or mana or whatever. So it can, it can come in handy. Again, you'll see nothing moves when I click appearance. Pretty useless. Unless you're going to make a flirty character. Who cares? Hit points. You'll see those are going up steadily. So if you want a high HP character, obviously invest in con. Nothing new here. So this is something I only just noticed. Increasing your intelligence increases the personal interest points, which I know from experience, these are the uh, points that you put into your occupation later. So it just occurred to me that you could have a more diverse character if you have a more intelligent character. I just realized that. And then strength, pretty straightforward. So let's actually make a character. I want a character who is smart, and dexterous so I don't need him to be burly I don't need him to be attractive I don't really need him to be all that sane to be completely honest so let's max out all right and So yeah, let's max out dexterity, intelligence, education. We've still got plenty of points left over. So let's put the rest into sanity. Oh, still have more. They really do allow quite a bit of variety in your character. The rest in sanity. Okay. So yeah, they give you a wide variety. Now what these numbers mean, in this game, you roll a D100. And if you, uh, let's say you have a uh, dexterity of 90, the, the, uh, the game master calls for you to make a dexterity check. You roll a 1d100, and if you roll a 90 or lower, you succeed. If you roll above a 90, you fail. So a higher score is better, rolling a lower number is better. And then the lower you, you roll, the, uh, the better the outcome. Now, everyone that I am familiar with uses uh, classic 1920s. Um, because that's kind of where Call of Cthulhu, like the original book series, are set in. Uh, I have not tested out any of these. I also would leave this at max 75, because max 99 allows you to set every stat at, like, 99, which is kind of ludicrous. It's kind of dumb. Like, that's... I mean, 90 is already good enough. If it's 99, <laughs> it's basically impossible to fail. Like, it completely removes any sense of chance so uh, age 
Now, the one thing you need to know about age is like if you make your character under 18 or over 65, uh, if she, uh, you have to reduce your stats. Uh, below 18, I think you have to reduce your mental stats. Over 65, you have to reduce your physical stats. So there are penalties for being really old or really young. But it does allow you to be um, uh, as young as 15. But yeah, five points have to be destruct. Oh, my apologies. Strength, size, and education are all affected. And you can see... Oh, I didn't realize that started at 40. Two improvements for education, five points to be deducted from strength, con, and dex, and appearance. Oof. And you can see that just as, you know, as we get older, all the way up to 90, 80 points to be deducted uh, from strength, <laughs> and four improvements to education. Like, that's crazy. You know what? Let's go nuts. Let's make uh, Patrick John Evans really old. Now, this is the mo arguably one of the most important things you can do. Because this is like your trait. This gives you special features that no one else has. Like an archaeologist, you know, uh, like it does exactly what you think it would do. I believe being a cultist uh, gives you access to magic. Uh, cult leader, yep. Yeah. Um, now in my game, I make everyone be like a normal person. Like if you're going to be an actor, you're a stage actor. If you want to be, you know, uh, uh, I don't let my players be like soldiers or like, you know, spec ops or whatever. So let's make him an archaeologist because honestly... Like, being a professor or an archaeologist or, you know, some sort of educated person is going to be so much more useful than um, being some, like, brute anyway. Like, I, like being a wrestler, you're not going to put too many things in a headlock, my guy. It's not going to come up, up that often. It's an investigative game, not a fighting game. Pick something, you know, worth picking. So, oops. Let's just say they're from Rockport, Massachusetts, because that's a setting of the game I'm currently in. We will go next. Now, this is where we get age-related updates. <laughs> uh, negative 85. <laughs> Um, I think that, uh, whoops, I think that breaks the game. Is it going to let me do that? Uh, whoops, reset. I will instantly fail all strength and constitution checks, which only leaves me with dexterity to deduct from holy shit. My education. You know what? Let's go back. Let's go backwards. I don't I don't want him to be ninety. I changed my mind. Let's uh
All right. So, so his name is now Colin Barnabas Goodman. Let's go with that. Oh, yeah. Archaeology. So, yeah, you'll see that um, nothing has to be deducted if you pick a character that's reasonably aged. So, whenever you're done, quick process updates. Let's do science. Um... Uh, what's a science we can do as an archaeologist? But xenobiology. As an archaeologist, I could have come out, come across some very strange uh, uh, creatures that I wanted to study. Now, credit rating is how much cash you have. Now, as you're pumping this up, uh, you'll notice that it's like it gives you like eighty dollars in cash on hand, and this is just like your assets that you can liquidate, and uh, this is how much you can take out as credit from the bank that you eventually have to pay back. Um, and you might say, "Hey, eighty dollars really isn't that much money," but um, keep in mind that this is nineteen twenties money, so uh, every dollar in the nineteen twenties is worth thirteen dollars today. So $80 is actually worth $1,040. You can be rich right from the get-go. I think this is the only game that allows you to be filthy fucking rich right from the start. $1,000 just as walking around money? You shitting me? It's great. Now, appraisal. Uh, now, this is... Uh, I've read some modules where appraisal does more than just tell you the value. It also lets you identify Whereas others say you need you specifically need archaeology. So being an archaeologist, I obviously want these skills. Library use, I don't really use in my games. Because like I feel like you don't really need to make a check to use a library if it's well organized. You know? <laughs> Spot hidden. You want this to absolutely be 75. Do not let this, you know... You are going to be an investigator. You are going to have to investigate. Don't let this fall by the wayside. No, 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 no. And I'll put all my remaining points in xenobiology. Because why not? All right. So now we are on to the final page. And this is um, everything else. And there are a lot of stats to go through. Most of them are self-explanatory. Like, I don't need to be an accountant. Anthropology could come in handy. Because anthropology is the study of humans throughout history. So let's crank that up. I don't need to be an artist. I don't need to be charming. You know, uh, credit rating is already maxed out. Cthulhu Mythos, uh, uh, this is how much uh, no knowledge you actually have about Cthulhu and the house of uh, Ryla and you know, Atlaknaka, and all the various weird and wonderful creatures of Cthulhu. Honestly, I feel like it makes sense for, like, your first character to start at zero. Maybe if you do more than one campaign, uh, uh, you know, or if your character dies and you're bringing in a new one, you want them to have a reasonable understanding of Cthulhu just on the same page, but I, I would honestly leave that at zero. Like, you're not supposed to know much about Cthulhu, you know? Disguise, who cares? Dodge, dodge, crank that up. Crank dodge to 75. Because the it doesn't have armor class in Call of Cthulhu. You uh, When they roll for hit, you roll for dodge. So you need to be able to get the fuck out of the way. Drive auto. This really doesn't come up all that often. Unless you're the type of person to get into a car chase. Honestly, my players are so used to playing in D&D. They forget that they have vehicles. <laughs> Electrical repair. Exactly what it sounds like. Fast talk. I honestly don't know what that means. Like, I'm, I'm assuming it's, like, when you're, like, talking jive, you're talking really fast, trying to, like, maybe, like, confuse your your uh, your opponent or, like, um, uh, just, like, talk circles around them. Maybe just to piss them off. I don't know. It hasn't really come up. If you have any desire whatsoever 
to be in melee combat, you're going to want to crank up Brawl, because that's going to be your ability to hit. This is what you're going to roll against their dodge if you make a melee attack. Or maybe you don't want to be a brawler per se. You're like, man, I'm not out here just doing ordinary fisticuffs. I know Taekwondo. I'm master of Taekwondo. So, what does that effectively do in game? Eh, it's up to the game master. Probably nothing. But, you know. Actually, I'm going to completely eliminate this. I don't need this. But it, it's it's an option that you have at your disposal. God, go away. Honestly, there's no real mechanical difference. This is purely flavor. Like, you just want to be a Taekwondo or Kung Fu or Karate or whatever. There are a lot of... Uh, in the modules that I have seen, there's a lot of guns. And mostly handguns. So I would encourage you to... Um, put some points into handgun because it's a very high chance that you're going to come in across handguns. <clears throat> uh, first aid, that's exactly what it sounds like. Your party is going to get injured. People are going to fall and uh, they're going to start dying and you need to be able to jump on them with gauze and alcohol and stitches so that they don't die. <laughs> very useful. Don't, don't neglect this. You want that at least 50. History, our intimidation, jump, languages, all, all relatively straightforward. Law, I haven't really seen that come in handy. Library use, who cares? Listen, see, here's the thing. In um, Call of Cthulhu, they don't have uh, perception and investigation. They have listen and spot hidden. Uh, so I, I would argue spot hidden is more important, but listen could come in handy. Um locksmithing uh, at least one person in your group should know how to pick a lock and that's just a given there's gonna be shit that you can't get into uh that you need to get into medicine this is not like emergency like uh emergency medical you know treatment this is you know your knowledge of medicine so you can treat diseases that aren't immediately life-threatening natural world this is kind of like a uh, nature check this is your biology this is your um, you know, ornithology, you know, uh, your study of nature. Navigate, this is your ability to uh, navigate open water on a boat at night using the stars and any other similar skill. Occult is kind of like the Call of Cthulhu version of a arcana role. It's like if you want to know what the goings on, like if you see a strange artifact and you're like, hmm, I wonder if I've heard a legend about this mysterious talisman. You can roll to see if your character knows. Operate heavy machinery. Never come in contact with that. Persuade exactly what it sounds like. Pilot, helicopter, airplane, whatever. Psychology and psychoanalysis. It's exactly what they say. Ride is specifically riding horses. You could argue it's riding motorcycles, but I, you know, most people would agree that's drive auto. Unless you're in the Western setting and horses are common, I would completely neglect this. Uh, sleight of hand, spot hidden, stealth, all exactly what they think. I do kind of like that they make swimming and throwing um, uh, their own separate skills. Because when I was in D&D, there would always be an argument of like, is it acrobatics or athletics to run, jump, swim, throw things? And people would always argue that they should just be able to use whichever the two they're better at. And uh, I was just gave in. Now there's a specific stat for it. If you want to throw something far, there's no arguing, is it acrobatics or, or you know, is it acrobatics or is it athletics? It's throw. It's its own thing. I really like that. These miscellaneous additional skills are pretty rare. You basically have to, con uh, you know, talk to your um, uh, game master and ask them, hey, can I be skilled in underwater basket weaving? You know, pretty rare that these are going to come in handy but you never know all right let's see i've got one point to spare <laughs> what do i even put it in cool. okay okay I 
get it. Jesus. All right. So once you're done with that, save it. Now, um, I typically go with basic auto-calculated character sheet. Um, I feel like it's the most straightforward. It has everything you conceivably need. The All the advanced character sheet does is just give you like a number line for your health and magic points. Like it'll give you like a full like list of numbers from like 1 through 20 or whatever. Which you don't need. You don't need number lines. You just need to type it in. Now this I don't understand. For some reason your magic, your health is lower than your max when you start. This is completely stupid, and I would change that. Um, now, a major wound. If you lose more than 50% of your HP in a single attack, you have a major wound. You can go temporarily insane or indefinitely insane, depending on your sanity. Um, if you lose more than 5 sanity points in a single encounter, you have a temporary bout of insanity. And then if you drop to below 15 sanity, which is why it's a good idea to, you know, at least put some points in that, then you go indefinitely insane. You're basically incapacitated until you can... I don't know if you're just incapacitated or if you just roleplay being crazy. I haven't gotten that far. These are all of your stats. We've gone over all of them. Now, you start with uh, no weapon. You just start with your brawl skill. Um... Now, this is something that's unique to Call of Cthulhu that I think is interesting. Since it's a D100 and there's so, you know, there's a hundred different intervals between, uh, as opposed to just a 1D20 plus your minus your bonuses, um, you, let's, you can roll below 25 to succeed, but if you roll 12 or lower, that's a hard success, extreme success. And um, if you roll an extreme success on an attack... Um, it is the maximum amount of damage on the die. So if you have a 1d3 plus your damage bonus, in this case it's minus 1. So 1d3 minus 1. So if you got an extreme success, that would be 2. You wouldn't have to roll. Like you would just automatically do 2 damage. That's not super useful for unarmed, but if you have a gun, like a revolver does 1d10. Um, then, you know, in extreme... Oh, okay. Uh, this game differentiates between blunt weapons, which are pretty self-explanatory, and impaling weapons, which they say includes both piercing and slashing, which I feel are different, but they kind of lump it all together. I feel like a slash with a sword and then a stab with a sword are a different type of damage, but in this game, they're all just lumped into impaling. Now, if you have an impaling weapon and you get an extreme success, not only do you deal max damage on the die, you get an additional d10 worth of damage that you can roll. And if you get a critical success and you have a firearm, uh, critical success being a nat 1, which is opposite to D&D, that's as good as you can possibly roll, then that second d10 also does max damage. So if you've got a revolver that does 1d10 damage, and then you extreme success, you get an extra die, crit success, so that max out, that's a guaranteed 20 damage, which is insane. There's basically nothing in the game that can survive 20 damage straight out. And even though it's a lot more complicated, I argue it's a lot more realistic, because when you're shooting at someone, where you hit them matters a lot. Like, did you wing them in the shoulder, or did you hit them between the eyes? I don't care how tough and muscular you are, or how much HP you have. You take a bullet between the eyes, you're going down. And you're going down hard. Now, combat is kind of weird. So, you know how I mentioned before that you roll to dodge, they roll to hit? Well, let's say uh, they have a 75 to hit, you have a 75 to dodge, and you both succeed. You both roll under. So if you tie, you go by whoever rolled lower, and that's how you determine a success or a failure. But let's say you have a, they have a 30 to hit, and you have a 60 to dodge, right? 
and you both roll 30. And you might say, well, we both rolled the same. We both succeed. We both rolled 30. It should be a tie. No, no, no. You see, if you have a, uh, a 60 to dodge and they have a 30 to hit and you both roll 30, that's a hard success for you. The type of success that you get is greater than theirs. Therefore, you win out. It goes by there's a normal success and a hard success, extreme success, and critical success. So it doesn't go by the number on the die. It goes by the level of success, which is takes some getting used to. But thankfully, they put the uh, normal, hard, and extreme successes next to every stat. So it, you don't have to think about it too much. You just roll, look at the graph. Oh, I rolled a two for electrical repair. Oh, that's an extreme success, you know? They, they list it all out for you. Honestly, this is all fluff. Like, what you're afraid of, who's significant to you, yada yada. This is all character fluff, backstory, etc. Obviously, you want to fill it out, but I have nothing meaningful to say on it. Now, this is... Um, uh, the, the This is the last thing I wanted to go over on the character sheet. So, levels of success... You know, we already talked about regular, hard, extreme, critical successes. Fail is just rolling above your skill. Fumble, this is like a critical fail. If you roll a 96 or higher on the die, unless you've decided to go allow your players to have like a 99 in one stat or something, um, 96 or higher is a critical fail. They just fail more hilariously. I don't use pushing the roll. Um, I, I don't like the idea that they can, uh, re-roll at a 1d10 disadvantage. What I might do is allow them to push their luck. And, um, so for luck specifically, if they want to quote unquote push their luck, let's say their, uh, luck score is a 65, they rolled a 70. What I might do in the future is allow them to spend five points. Like if they rolled a 70 their score is a 65, they can permanently reduce their luck by five points in order to succeed in the moment. And I might allow that for luck just so that they can um, uh, make it more dynamic. Like, mm, do I, how much do I want to succeed? Is it worth permanently reducing my score to succeed on this one moment? That I might do. But everything else, no, I'm not allowing pushing rolls. Healing is a lot more realistic, but also kind of a pain in the ass. In D&D, &D, a long rest, you heal everything, which isn't realistic, but it's handy. Uh, first aid heals 1 HP. Medicine, 1d3 HP. Not a lot. Um, and uh, even when you're... Uh, um, even if you're, like, resting, you recover 1 HP per day... 2 HP per day if you're in a hospital. It takes forever to heal. Like, if you go down, if you drop to zero, you don't just, you know, take a nap, wake back up, and you're good to go. If you have 9 HP, well, guess what, buddy? You're going to be out of commission for over a week. <laughs> now, of course, it's up to the players to decide if they want to... Um, um, you know, do they just are going to wait at the hospital and bring the game to a, a standstill and do a time skip? Or if they're going to be adventuring without you while you're in the uh, in the hospital and basically play without you, which I think is a dick move. But yeah, um, it's pretty much all I had. The, the game feels confusing at first. Like, there's a lot to, like, absorb really fast. But once you play a game or two and you get within the rhythm and you're like, you get used to rolling D100s and you're like, and, uh, you know, it, you get used to it very quickly. It all starts to make sense. Uh, there's one last thing that I forgot to mention. So when you're making a check, you've got these <clears throat> regular hard and extreme successes. The DM can say, all right, uh, you want to uh, use your mechanical repair skill 
to repair a car. Well, this is a unique type of car, so this is going to be a hard check. So then you would have to roll for your mechanical repair, not a 10, but a 5. And on top of that, he can also add disadvantages on top of raising the, uh, the level of difficulty. So not only can it say, oh, it's a hard check to repair this car, it's also raining. So I'm going to give you disadvantage, and there are three levels of disadvantage, normal, hard, and extreme, e uh, and each one is just an additional 1d10 that you add to your roll. So let's say he's like, all right, you get one disadvantage die because it's raining. It's a hard check because this is a car you're not familiar with. So you roll, and you get that five. You get that hard success. Uh, uh, uh. You get a 1d10 penalty because it's raining. You roll it. You roll it. Let's say you get a 10, now your score is 15. Now you don't even get a normal success. You just fail outright. You know? They could do that. The DM is uh the game master rather is well within his rights to say this is an extreme challenge and it, you have an extreme disadvantage. So not only do you have to get an extreme success, you have to add 3 1d10s to your roll. So even if skill that you're extremely good at like, you know, I'm good at appraisal. I could have to roll a 15 or lower while adding three D10s. So I would have to not only roll a 15, but I'd have to get really uh, decent rolls on those three D10s to make this appraisal. It's basically him saying it's functionally impossible. I'm letting you roll to humor you. Because if it's a extreme, it re requires an extreme success, and you have an extreme disadvantage. Statistically, oh, damn near zero percent chance you're gonna make it. But yeah, <laughs> he's just humoring you and allowing you to roll for your own amusement at that point. Like I wouldn't even bother rolling if he said it requires an extreme success and you have an extreme disadvantage. Don't even bother. <laughs> But yeah, that's basically all there is to it with the character sheet. I might do more of these and go through some one-shots or walk through an encounter. But that's all I've got for you. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you're uh, interested in uh, playing Call of Cthulhu in the future. Later.